Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. I'm Apoorva and I'm the South Asia Coordinator for the Palestinian BDS National Committee. And I'm really excited to join uh, and start this conversation on Israel's military occupation, its ties uh, with the Global South, and how we can build a campaign for military embargo against Israel. I have with me Marin, who is with the Palestinian Stop the Wall campaign and the BDS National Committee, Pedro, who is the BDS Latin America coordinator, and Gautam, who is a democratic rights activist and associated with NewsClick. I first invite Marin to talk about uh, Israel's military occupation, its nature and tactics in Palestine. Marin. Thanks a lot for having me here. It's uh, a pleasure to be in touch again with uh, India and the struggle for justice in Palestine from India. Um, well, talking about Israel's military occupation could be a task to talk about 60 years uh, of crimes and human rights violations, and I don't think I have the time here. What I will try to do is just uh, highlight a bit the military aspect in how Israel over the last 60 years since its establishment has been able to develop ideology, methodology, and technology that has allowed it to expel more than half of the Palestinian people from their lands, to uh, take over uh, the vast majority of Palestinian territory, so that at the end of the day today, Palestinians have free access only to 13% of their own lands if they're not already refugees and can't even access that one, and are repressed and discriminated against in a cruel system of apartheid. And evidently the system of apartheid colonialism lent that. Uh, and occupation needs to be enforced militarily by force and by repression. And I guess most of uh, the people uh, watching this program have still the images of uh, the various massacres in Gaza, including the war uh, on Lebanon in 2006, uh, uh, in their minds and the uh, dramatic display of a military power against the fundamentally uh, uh, civilian population. And this kind of uh, military development from the warplanes to the tanks uh, uh, to the drones and so on is uh, something that Israel has started to develop itself since uh, uh, the si Six Days wars, War and since uh, the 70s really until a level that it has become a cornerstone of its own economy. Israel is de facto living uh, on the profits of a veritable war economy. Many of those uh, weapons are as well coming through U.S. aid, military aid uh, uh, to Israel and from Europe uh, as well. But uh, the war economy, the Israel's own eco uh, military industry, is key uh, as well in allowing Israel to do these crimes and allowing it to do it in an economically sustainable way. Because all those things, those weapons that are being tested and being developed on the Palestinian people then are being exported. 70% of Israel's military uh, industry is for export. But it's not only these kind of dramatic shows of military prowess and uh, uh, strength like uh, during the Gaza massacres. It's as well the day-to-day -day repression uh, as part of Israel's occupation in the West Bank and Gaza that uh, and Jerusalem, evidently, that are a key aspect of Israel's uh, military uh, industry and uh, military technology. Um, one can develop everyday new weapons uh, to uh, repress people. One of the key uh, uh, weapons, for example, that has be, have been developed and that have already been exported to India are the skunk weapons. It's a way to use uh, stench uh, to uh, um, attack uh, people and their villages when uh, their protest, for, for example, in the West Bank and Israel is... Uh, uh, now, since a few years, uh, using uh, these skunk weapons that uh, spray uh, 
indistinctly uh, uh, demonstrators, homes, uh, families, uh, with an uh, almost indeletable uh, stench. But it's as well the methodology on how you hunt down activists, how do you repress uh, human rights defenders. And uh, more than that, it is as well the day-to-day surveillance. One of the key uh, aspects of Israel's uh, military repression is uh, that you can't escape it. It's every day, everywhere, in everyday life. Whatever you do uh, is being controlled from the physical checkpoints that are around there to cyber surveillance systems, uh, uh, to uh, um, ways how you have to get uh, permission because you are controlled in whatever you're doing in your life. And all this is being uh, evidently implemented uh, on behalf of the Israeli state, but implemented uh, by over 7,000 uh, Israeli companies that are doing this and are using Israel, uh, Israel's occupation and uh, apartheid as a veritable laboratory where the Palestinian people are becoming the guinea pigs for Israel's military industry. And I think an important part when looking into that military and security industry is as well understanding that we're not only talking about the development of uh, methodology and technology of repression and killing and massacres, but as well uh, about an ideology and doctrines of repression. And uh, one of the key contributions that Israel has given to today's world, uh, they're not the only ones uh, within that framework working. The U.S. is uh, pretty much involved as well, but Israel, Israel and Israel's university, uh, universities have been key in redeveloping the concept of war. When the big uh, uh, achievement after the Second World War was that we actually had a system of international law that defined between a state of war and a state of peace, between combatants and civilians. What Israel has strategically done is to break down that line. We are now talking about non-conventional wars, whatever wars that may be, the war on terror, the war on drugs, the war on whatever, which is non-conventional where the rules of war, the Fourth Geneva Convention, the limits that the world has given itself after the Second World War are broken down and you can uh, do two very interesting and important things. First of all, you can treat civilians as combatants, fundamentally. You can use exactly the same methods uh, that you're using, or in theory, you, you would be supposed to be using only in war. And the second key thing is you can sell your technology, not only for use during war in a defined territory, in a defined time, but you can use it to everyone in every place. Uh, two key examples, for example, the question of how you deal with uh, prisoners. In theory, you should give people that are not combatants uh, some civil rights uh, when you repress them. Uh, Israel doesn't even do that one. Palestinians as such are enemies and as such are having military courts and as such are not having uh, citizens' rights. And when we're looking at it, uh, we see that there has been, uh, in, in the development around the globe, uh, a strong development towards that, to eroding at least the minimum civil, uh, civil rights. And Israel, once again, has been a model in that one. Another example that I think is important is the question on how you're actually exporting uh, military technology to a civilian space. Uh, one key example is the idea of smart cities. Smart cities is fundamentally a development that uh, comes from the idea that I need to have a surveillance city where I can surveil everybody at every time. Um, and that was a development that Israel has created uh, to uh, surveil the Palestinian people. Now it has become 
an experience and a, a mode of thinking cities from Brazil, I think Pedro can talk about it, to India, where we're having as well the idea of smart and safe cities coming in. Or a question like Pegasus. Pegasus is a cyber surveillance system that Israel has developed to survey, first of all, the Palestinian people, and now it is exporting it around the world, and human rights defenders, politicians, activists all over the world are now uh, facing these kind of Israeli weapons and Israeli technologies. All of them are coming out of the Israeli military uh, structure. So in that sense, I do think uh, when we're looking at the overall structure of Israel's military and so-called security, homeland security technology, it is something that is evidently killing Palestinians every day. But it is a conjunction of ideology, methodology, and technology that is really harming uh, people all over the world and is strengthening uh, a vision of a world where a global right wing from uh, India to uh, Europe's neo-fascists to uh, Brazil, Colombia and others are taking advantage of these kind of uh, technologies that are developed on the blood of the Palestinian people and are using them. And I do think we have a common ground with the Palestinian people all over the world to say we do not want these kind of weapons. We don't want them and these kind of methodologies. We don't want them in Palestine, but we don't want them in any place around the world. In this sense, I guess the question of uh, Israeli military embargo, the call uh, for Israel not to be allowed to export its uh, uh, technology is a question not only of support for the Palestinian people, but a fundamental question for our humanity today. Uh, thanks, Marin. And we'll actually come back to that uh, question of military embargo uh, in a bit. But now I'd like to have Pedro talk about what partnership with Israel has meant for Latin America, especially in terms of military ties. I was just thanking you for having me, and it's a pleasure to, to see Gautam and Apurva again. Um, well, I'm speaking from Brazil, and as you know, we are currently under a government that openly um, supports Israel's apartheid regime. But not only that, uh, has stated that wants to bring more Israeli repressive technology to repress our own people, especially black and poor people in favelas. Um, Rio de Janeiro is maybe one of the symbols of what, uh, what militarization of uh, cities can mean. Uh, gathering experience from the military intervention that Brazil led in Haiti and bringing together all the experience that Israel had in oppressing Palestinians, they established what they call pacifying units in Rio's favelas, which basically means militarizing all aspects of life of people living there. Um, what happens now is that in our last election, new, uh, Rio de Janeiro's new governor announced that he would go to Israel to bring more technology, specifically drones, to shoot people in favelas. Those were his expressions. Precisely to shoot people in their heads. That's how he referred to it. Um, of course, he is buying from the best. If you want to kill someone and repress the people, go to Israel. That's where you can find the best technology you can. Uh, specifically from companies like Elbit System, uh, world's leading producer of drones, that tests most of his, uh, its drones and strikes against the people in, in the occupied besieged Gaza Strip. Um, if one looks into Elbit's profits and launches of new drones, it's clear that its profits and launches of new drones come right after strikes in Gaza. So they can sell those drones to countries like Brazil and local governments like Rio de Janeiro, uh, saying that they were tested in the back of the world, and they actually were. Uh, Rio de Janeiro governor actually went to Israel and came back not only excited about buying drones to shoot people in their heads in Brazilian favelas, but also to bring the cybersecurity and different surveillance technologies that, as Marin was commenting about Pegasus, are also a leading 
uh, field of exportation for Israel. Um, last year, because all of that, and considering Israel's uh, con military connections to the region, also historically, which I'm going to comment in a bit, uh, we held a popular hearing in Rio, gathering together different social movements that are affected in different ways by militarization processes in our region that are deeply connected to Israel's apartheid. Um, in this public hearing, this popular hearing, we gathered information that we're compelled to gather with a lot of research in a report that uh, maybe Apurva can share with you afterwards. They have an English uh, translation of that. Um, gathering all the information we have about the different ties between Israel and Latin American governments and the private sector around militarization. The conclusions we come, first of all, is that these relations are historical relations. If we look into Israel's support to South Africa's apartheid, for example, while the whole world was boycotting the regime, Israel was providing it with uh, the military technology and even helping them to develop uh, uh, nuclear uh, projects, the same happened in Latin America. Uh, Israel was providing direct support, not only political support, to the dictatorships that uh, shouted our region. Um, specifically, we look if we look to Central America, for example, we see Israeli companies training uh, the, the the armed groups that were uh, trying to stop uh, revolutionary groups or resistance groups to, to develop their resistance. If we look into Israel's support to the dictatorship in Argentina, um, it was providing weapons and direct uh strategy and uh, knowledge to the regime to disappear with hundreds of thousands of people in that country. Uh, the same in Brazil, the same in the, in recent developments in, in human rights violations in the region. So besides that historical development, uh, what the report assessed is that we have today different levels of um, connection between Israel's military and our region. Uh, I'm going to list some of them and give some of some examples, because unfortunately, we have hundreds of pages of examples that 10 minutes wouldn't even be able to, to cover a little bit. Um, and that's quite symptomatic of the amount of relations we have. Um, well, the first sector we need to appoint here, the first type of connection, is of course government-government connection. And here it is important to to emphasize that when we talk about governments, we're not talking only about national governments, as I think. Um, we're talking about direct contracts with local governments, uh, not only on security, also at infrastructure level, water agreements, etc. But specifically for the conversation we are having here, it's important to emphasize that there's a lot of security cooperation going from local governments towards Israel and vice versa. Um, in this government-to-government -government contract, of course, national governments hold the biggest contracts and perhaps the most um, valuable ones uh, in terms of money. Uh, a lot of other cooperation agreements sometimes are technical agreements, exchange between police, training the, the local forces on how to repress uh, people in, in poor neighborhoods, using the techniques Israel developed uh, oppressing Palestinians under its uh, apartheid regime. But if we look into companies, we can highlight some huge Israeli companies that are the ones being most benefited by this government-to-government -government agreement. Uh, we have, first of all, the one that I mentioned, Albert System. It's the biggest Israeli military company. Um, and it's present in almost all Latin American countries in different ways. Um, we could refer, for example, to the to different drones uh, produced by Elbit being used and sold uh, to countries like Honduras, Colombia, Chile, Peru, Ecuador. Uh, we used to have a huge deal between Brazil and Elbit system that maybe afterwards when we speak about strategies around military embargo, we can comment on that as a, an example of a successful campaign we had to break that deal. But the fact is that Elbit is all around the region. 
it's not the only uh, military company coming from Israel involved in those government-to-government -government, uh, contracts. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Israel Air Industries, we have uh, Rafael, another huge Israeli company that provides a lot of the missiles uh, in the region for Chile, Peru, Ecuador, anti-tank missiles. We have missiles used by blends uh, provided by this company to governments in Brazil, Colombia. Uh, Pegasus, as Martin mentioned, is another um, project that comes from Israel in another context that is cybersecurity. Uh, you probably uh, saw on the news a uh, few months ago the scandals around Pegasus and election and data from the government in Mexico, for example. So we have all these different companies embedded in different deals. On the civil security level, another access that we could analyze, we also have a lot of different Israeli companies, but not only Israeli companies, and at this point it's important to say that Israel's militarization complex and oppression against Palestinian people also involve international and transnational companies. They are there uh, providing services for the Israeli government and exporting that experience to different countries. One of these key companies are G4S. G4S is one of the biggest uh, security, private security companies in the world. And um, until recent, it was responsible for several of the prisons where Palestinian political prisoners are being, are being held, some of them under administrative detention, with no trial, no right to defense, and with the possibility of uh, that detention being ext be extended uh, indeterminately. Uh, G4S, after losing several deals around the world because of BDS campaigns, uh, left the, the prison system in Israel, but it still trains the Israeli police in occupied Jerusalem, which is a reason for us to keep boycotting this company and pressuring it to break all ties with Israel. The important uh, thing about this example is that, again, we're, trying about how, we're talking about how our struggles connect. The campaign against G4S is a campaign that mobilized different people around the world, also in Latin America, and it had few victories against the company here, because it's also repressing us. It's also affecting how security is being privatized in all the different countries, and it's also helping on processes that incarcerate black and poor youth, not only in Latin America, but also in the U.S., where G4S uh, used to have uh, contracts uh, in youth detention centers and also lost those contracts because of BDS campaigns. If you look into the civil sector, and I'll, I'll try to conclude in, in just a couple of minutes, um, we have companies like HP, that I'm sure you're also familiar in India, and it's deeply connected to Israel's military uh oppression against Palestinians, providing the, the surveillance and, and digital screening and the different technologies that are embedded in checkpoints uh, the, um, that, that control Palestinian lives every day. Um, finally, as Martin was saying, when we talk about military cooperation, we need to assess the different types of agreements, exchange of cooperation, uh, training, etc., that includes many times universities. So our report also looked into these different types of agreements and how universities in Latin America or local governments are also establishing partnerships of research or giving scholarships for Latin Americans to go to Israeli companies or to Israeli government programs or universities to learn about these uh, developments and technologies to then apply them against our own population. Um, I couldn't conclude this explanation, this brief explanation, without mentioning the the recent connections around the wall, the wall that Donald Trump announced wants to build in the Mexico border, but has been built since before by other U.S. presidents, and that includes a lot of Israeli technology. And as soon as uh, uh, Donald Trump announced he was building the wall, Netanyahu gave support to the idea. And several Israeli companies start trying to, to get the different deals around the new productions. Um, Elbit, the company I was mentioning that, lead, that leads the production of drones around the world, um, and, who is deep, and which is deeply involved uh, in the construction of the wall that Israel built against Palestinians violating international law, is one of the companies involved in the, uh, in the wall in the U.S.-Mexico border. G4S, the company I was just talking about, the transnational private security company, 
is also involved in surveillance uh, and arresting migrants to try to cross the border in that region. So where we see human rights violations, Israel sees opportunity to export its industry. And unfortunately, Latin America is a place full of human rights violations, and the rise of extreme rights is only increasing the situation, which makes us a very profitable and interesting market to the Israeli military. So more than ever, it's important that we connect our struggles and talk about strategy to stop this global industry of oppression with an international uh, resistance against this globalized um, militarization and oppression that Israel is leading around the world. Thank you very much. Pleasure to meet Pedro and Maren again, even if it's long distance, but at least I can see you and it feels good to know that you are hale and hearty and doing well. Uh, India's relations with Israel have been uh, uh, underwent a change uh, by around 1990s. And it's in the last 30 years we have seen the relation between India and Israel uh, become closer and the military ties in particular uh, develop. But it's around the turn of the millennium, 2000 onwards, that one sees a spurt in India's military relations with Israel. And there are three areas which I'd like to point towards. One is, of course, that we are buying increasingly uh, equipment or components from Israeli military companies uh, uh, directly uh, for India's military use and for India's paramilitary use, including light weapons, drones, um, and in the process in the last 20 years, there have been a number of Indian companies which have tied up or set up joint ventures with Israeli corporations. They don't necessarily carry the same name as the original Israeli companies, so it's difficult to track them down. They operate under new names in India as joint ventures. But nevertheless, there has been a significant increase in relation between uh, Indian corporate houses tying up with, with Israeli companies and manufacturing a variety of uh, military equipment from drones, missiles, light weapons, so on and so forth. That is one area of cooperation that has been there for the last 20 years and it's actually increased by leaps and bounds to the point where India buys about 12% of its total imports. And India being the largest importer of arms in the world, 12% of its imports come from Israel, which constitutes about 50% of Israel's total uh, weapon or military related exports. So it's a very significant market for Israel. The second area which lately we have come to notice and which we find that it's, this is something which is developing even more. Although the relation goes back to 1994 for the first time when India uh, turned to Israel to learn from it how to build a fence or a wall uh, to so-called protect itself from a so-called proxy war from being waged by Pakistan. So, the surveillance system, the whole idea of fencing, uh, sensors, etc., uh, and the expertise very largely came from Israel. That is another area of relationship that has developed. And this is primarily confined to the area of, of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, where there is a, uh, where there is a, a what, what one could, an internal war going on, and a war of suppression, a military suppression of a popular movement which demands right of self-determination or freedom from Indian occupation. The third area that is actually uh, something that one should be looking at more closely is the increasing reliance on method methodology and ideology, which is getting reinforced uh, in India. It's not as if India, India lacked any such ideology or methodology for the last 300 years. 
Uh, we have a long tradition and history of it, having lived under British Raj for more than 200 years, followed by past 17 years, 70 years, where we have seen uh, the Indian state becoming more repressive and becoming more sophisticated in the kind of repressive methods that it used. And it's here that Israel has come and started playing at quite an important role as reinforcing the already existing methodology and ideology with by fine tuning and by providing real life experience as they claim from occupied territories in Palestine, bringing it for use in countries like India. And I'm sure that this is probably being shared elsewhere too, but in India it's noticeable, um, uh, very clear. So, so these are three areas of relations between India and Israel that need to be monitored. What is important is then when we talk about solidarity, we tend to talk about solidarity from the point of view of lending support for a movement which is just legitimate, fighting for, for rights which are theirs, um, that is one level of solidarity. The other nature of solidarity is to try and link your own struggles that are taking place in your country with what is going on in Palestine at the hands of Israeli forces and see where this, uh, uh, the experience of Israel is getting transmitted to other places and other conflicts where they're coming in, coming in use. The third is, as far as India is concerned, and which is where we have been the weakest, is that there are real life experience and real lessons to be learned from what Israel is doing in Palestine with what India is doing in Kashmir. While there are no one-to-one -one relation between Palestine and Kashmir, there is a close similarities for a variety of reasons between what is happening in Palestine and what is happening in Kashmir or what is happening in Palestine to the Palestinians is also something we increasingly notice as being the Kashmiri people being subjected to. This unfortunately, just like in Israel where the Israeli civilian population has not been very vociferous in, in, in critiquing their own governments and regimes, military depression and oppression of Palestinian people and uh, the extraordinary lens to which they go, uh, the similar problem exists in India where drawing any parallel with Kashmir or what is happening in Kashmir does not, hand, does not uh, arouse much support from the civilian or uh, population or from the opinion makers in India. But this is one area which needs to be monitored because there are many parallels. Quite apart from the fact that both were part of, uh, India was a British uh, colony just as Palestine was a British colony. Quite apart from that and at, it's around the same time that the problems emerged, 1947-48 for Palestine and similar for India. In a formal sense I'm talking about, although the preparations went on for much longer leading up to the developments of 1948 in, in the case of Palestine. But the point I'm trying to make is that there are many similarities that one has to look at. There are many uh, ideological fine tunings that is going on in India, which is where we are borrowing very heavily from the experience of Israeli forces in occupied territories and trying to use them, not just in Kashmir, as we noticed last year, in, in, a, in, a, in a small town in South India, uh, where people were agitating against a corporate uh, house for polluting the river, the land and the seas and uh, affecting the, the, the health and livelihood needs of the people. Uh, we found that they, the, the police had been trained by Israeli uh, experts and the manner of shooting civilians without any warning, aiming at the head or the chest, meaning that they want they aim to kill, was something for the first time we saw. This was the first time it got exposed. We don't know whether similar uh, things that have happened elsewhere in India also have Israeli trainers or manuals or experience uh, behind them, uh, because they the, the those evidence has not have not come out in the public domain. But we understand that this has been going on. Uh, in the last four years, in fact, it has been formalized 
and uh, senior police officers who are trained and pass out, they spend a week in Israel to learn from Israeli forces and experts something how they deal with population. And population control has become, in this age that we are talking about, terrorism which reduces a movement, it damns a movement, demonizes a movement, delegitimizes a movement by characterizing a people's movement as a terrorist movement, which robs them of history, agency and everything and their own motivation. This has been happening but it has reached a point where quite like in, in, in Israel, Indian army generals openly talk about now a system of war which where the center of gravity would be population. Now, once you put center of gravity, if the military forces regard population as the center of gravity, which means that that is what you have to target, it becomes very clear that you are imitating what the Israelis have already been doing for many uh, decades, or uh, at least for many years, if not decades, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Palestinians uh, at the hands of Israeli forces. We see this happening in India too where the distinction between combatants and civilian has been blurred. Uh, Indian armed forces, when they go and do, uh, undertake uh, army operations, they target even civilians by saying that these are accomplices of terrorists, uh, by calling them accomplices because they come out, shout slogans in support of the militants who are fighting because they regard themselves as freedom fighters who are fighting for their cause or throw stones at the forces, or shout slogans in support of the militants and encourage them to, to, to fight on, or try and help them to escape from it. They've all become accomplices of terrorism, and they are now targets uh, of, of, of military forces which are uh, deployed for operations. The dangerous thing is that this blurring has meant that even those who come out and shout slogans, slogans in favor of freedom from India, are become are targeted and become uh, uh, accomplices of terrorists for merely shouting slogans or carrying banner which protests uh, which protest Indian occupation. So, in short, what we see happening in Kashmir. I would not say, and it would be too much to, 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 to credit Israel for creating the conditions that we have, but definitely there is a fine tuning and the, the, the regime, the repressive machinery is becoming far more efficient than what have been, they have been. Uh, they are fine tuning it and that this expertise is coming from Israel. We are faced with, uh, with, uh, with uh, two sets of problems in, in India. One is, of course, as I mentioned, the taking of the issue of Kashmir always is a tricky issue in a country like India. But that apart, there are many other areas where it is possible to bring in Palestine into a conversation because many of the struggles face uh, suppression at the hands of either a militarized, heavily, a police force that is getting heavily militarized and heavily armed uh, in the bargain, uh, uh, where Israeli uh, expertise or Israeli influence can be, can, can, can be deciphered. Uh, so it is possible to try and talk about Palestine in the context of other struggles and to enlarge the area so that our conversations refer to the experience of the Palestinian people at the hands of Israeli and to do parallels with what is happening in India. It's a tall order, it's a tall ask, but it is possible. But we have to somewhere along the line, unfortunately, whether we like it or not in India, we have to somewhere along the lines recognize that there are similarity between what is happening in Palestine at the hands of Israeli forces and what is happening to in Kashmir in India at the hands of Indian forces, which need to be highlighted uh, in order to build up support and solidarity uh, for, the, for the Palestinians, but at the same time ensure that other struggles that are going on also get noticed 
and our solidarity for the Palestinians also extend then to solidarity with other people suffering uh, similar suppression or repression at the hands of their own government and their own military forces. <laughs> Yeah.